Okay, Wonderful. So We're all together. <laughs> thank you for y'all's patience. Um, I'm just going to give a truncated intro just because um, even though I do believe in honoring folks' work and um, sharing your, your full bios, what I really want to say is thanks to Auburn Avenue Research Library. It happened again. You can't hear you. No. <laughs> okay, we'll just jump right into it. We're just going to go and then you can come back in when you need to and tell yeah. us the rest. <laughs> Hopefully our mics stay on. Well, this made it easy to uh, break the ice, Lee. <laughs> just a little technical difficulty. Um, I'm so honored to sit with you and chat with you. I followed your work from for a long time. I've been in the ag world um, and just been a huge fan. I want us to just take a moment though um, to pause for this moment um, and honor your offerings to humanity and um, to all of us who get a privilege to sit here with you. So just a moment, we can all just inhale say a silent thank you or a verbal thank you. Thank you so much, Leah. Um, so in reading your book, which I was just like honored to spend time with and kind of geeked out just for the, your approach you took with the facts, the interviews, the bios um, of everybody it was like, oh, I know so many of these people. And wait, why don't I know some of these other people? Mm -hmm. It was really, really exciting. Um, the first question I have for you, because you asked everybody in some shape or form is, what is the earth saying to you in this moment, but also while you were writing it, what was the earth saying to you? Mm. How is she communicating with you? I love that question. And yes, the 40 plus interviewees were all asked the same, like, what is she saying? And so to back up a little bit, I will tell you what she's saying to me, but the inspiration for asking that question actually came from one of our great agricultural genius entrepreneurs, Dr. George Washington Carver, mm -hmm. who in the late 1800s and the early 1900s, generations before the Rodale Institute popularized organic, was encouraging folks to cover crops, to take care of the soil, rotate crops, you know, muck out mulch and compost from the forests and the wetlands in order to fortify these soils that had been devastated by generations of cotton monocropping. And in doing so, lifted many, many households, Black households out of poverty. So much so that Albert Einstein considered Dr. Carver one of the 10 greatest minds of all time. Mm. We know about the peanut, we know about his inventions, right? But when he was asked by his friend, Glenn Clark, what is it, what was the source of these ideas, these innovations? And he said unequivocally, you know, I go out into the forest every morning before dawn and I listen to the voice of God through the trees because nature is God's unlimited broadcasting station through which he speaks to me every minute, every hour, every day, if I just tune to the right, frequency. And this beautiful process of listening to the earth, listening to the voice of the divine through the flowers, through the through the peanut, through nature, you know, he, to know what to do with the peanut, he just asked the peanut because God is, is there too, was so moving to me as someone who's trained in science, but also has deep spiritual practice and um, and you know, in many ancestral tradi traditions to see that there is not this dichotomy. And so I got really curious, like who else in our lineage is practicing earth listening? You know, Wangari Matai, who responsible for 51 million trees planted was a deep earth listener, right? John Edmondson, the taxidermist who taught ornithology to Charles Darwin, deep earth listener to the birds and on and on and in our lineage. So for me, in the process of this book was like a rehydration mm -hmm. of a childhood remembering of a way of being much more attuned to that listening. And so there are a lot of things that Earth is saying all the time. But I think one of the most important things that came up for me was the importance of rekindling that practice of reading the Earth as a sacred text. 
you think of the way that we pick up a Bible or a Torah or a Quran or an Oduifa and we read it for its literal meaning, then we read it for its hidden meaning, its esoteric meaning, until we peel back the layers of the onion to get at this ultimate truth. And the earth is also a text. She speaks in ice cores, she speaks in bird songs, she speaks in tree rings, she spe speaks in the whispers of the wind, right? And, and in tuning in again to be able to read the earth as primary source and as sacred text reveals all, like, all we need to know. And that was probably the biggest lesson, something that I'm carrying forward from the process of, of the research and writing of Black Earth Wisdom. That is remarkable to pull from the ancestry and be able to apply it and then just ask beyond yourself as well, how else other people or what else other people are hearing um, the earth say and to compare it and hold it as in high regard, like spiritual text, right? Because so much is being said and <clears throat> I'm really grateful. A lot of, a number of your interviewees talked about the earth or in order to be in right relationship with the earth that we have to slow our pace. And I often think of like nature as religion but also moving at the pace of nature. Um, mm -hmm. You know, you're a farmer so you, you know all the things that take and require patience. Um, but I also know that in the, as particularly in this country, how hard it is for people to access time because of the pace of consumerism and capitalism. What kind of practical things could you offer folks to slow their pace just a little bit so that they could possibly <laughs> hear the earth a little bit better or for the first time perhaps? Mm -hmm. Well, I'm chuckling to myself because I'm a very fast paced person. I really like to move. I'm like the fly buzzing about, which is also part of nature. But uh, I hear your question and I'll, I'll um, again, zoom out and then come to directly mm -hmm. answer. So I was sitting with Dr. Lorette Savoy last night. We had a book talk at this bookstore in Western Mass, lovely conversation among other talents. Uh, Dr. Lorette is a geologist. So talk about time, right? Talk about mm -hmm. time. Uh, she's on like a galactic time scale. And so something, a, a story that I shared with her, which is I think my first real reckoning with, uh, longitudinal time to happen a couple of years ago we were at, at soul fire farm where where i live and work and love and uh tiffany lachey who's a black soil scientist was a guest facilitator here at soul fire and she was doing a workshop on taking soil cores so for folks who aren't soil nerds like me a soil core is basically when you take this like stick with a cylinder on the bottom and you twist it into the ground and you pull out a cylinder of of soil and then you twist below that hole until you get another cylinder and you keep going down as far as you can till you have a long core with, with rings, with like layers of soil. And she's, she's very experienced and, and learned, so she could read the core. She was like, okay, uh, here's you know, a thousand plus years ago where these forests were burned to make more habitat for deer by the native folks here. It's the 1800s when the sheep craze came to New York and there was a million sheep. You can see this black line of sheep manure. So she was reading, I'm just seeing colors and she's telling me all these things. And then we get to the current day and there's a foot of black, rich, beautiful humus topsoil. She goes, and that's y'all. That's you from 2006 when you got here until present, this is the soil that you built. So. Footnote, when we when we wet ourselves to this land, there was almost no topsoil. It was eroded, really poor quality mountainside land, hard pan clay. You could barely put a shovel into it. So over the entire time we've been here, we've been building with Dr. Carver's strategies, right? With the mulch and the compost and the cover cropping, the rotational grazing, no-till, polyculture, on and on, all these Afro-Indigenous practices, building soil over time. So here is, and soil, by the way, takes a thousand years to build an inch on its own. We built a foot and she took it one step further and she said, you know, this will be in the permanent geological record that you were here and that you contributed. And I was like, thinking about what Dr. Drew Lanham said for Black Earth Wisdom, he's an ontologist I interviewed. He said, when aliens come down and take geological slices, they're gonna see a layer of plastic and death where we all live. That's like humanity's contribution, plastic mm -hmm. and death, but not everywhere. In some places you'll see this black, rich contribution. And to get to your question about slowing down, 
I think capitalism forces us to think in quarterly returns. How much do the stockholders get by the end of Q1, Q2, Q3? We need to be thinking in generational returns mm -hmm. about our grandchildren's grandchildren. And it's not so yes, right? To like moving the body slower. And I love meditation and, and pausing and spiritual practice. But even more so, the, the slowing down in relationship to time is I actually think flipping the scale at which we are focusing our energy, both to be able to sustain hope, because there's no way we're going to mm -hmm. undo 500 years of racial patriarchal capitalism in my lifetime or you know even two lifetimes it's going to take some time you know but also because it holds us accountable to the big picture of the long game in a way that focusing on the minutia really doesn't thank you for that um and the generational component of that right like doing work that will benefit the generations after us and recalling the work of the generations before us so that it can continue to to move forward um you talk about being among the trees that have been here for generations and generations and generations and you also incorporate you know your early upbringing into the introduction as well and so and which is is i can't verbatim talk about it but like the beauty that you have these memories of starting your environmental club with your sister <laughs> like and then looking at you now so i think it's a two-part question did you think this is where you would be and what does little leah young leah think of where you are now have you well, yeah is she satisfied is she like this is exactly where i wanted us to be or is she like you took a turn you know what is she saying <laughs> I love the question about little Leah and since childhood. So I'm going to tell folks in on, on childhood, which I do think is, I think it's probably unconventional to have been so sure about destiny and path from such a young age. I was very sure from age five or six that my life was in service to the earth. And I think this came in part because growing up as a mixed race, you know, black child in a very small town, uh, being our family was one of the few sometimes the only multiracial families in the town school was a cruel place to say the least it was a socially very cruel place so my siblings and i took a lot of refuge in the forest and credit to our parents our father especially for nurturing that relationship with lake watadic and the patches of wood sorrel around the house and the sun dappled moss and the islands of blueberries and the mountain i mean these were without exaggeration, kin, you know, family, the trees were parents. And so when we were very young, my sister Naima and I invented, a, or we thought we invented a religion, turned out later we remembered it, but we invented a religion called Mother Nature, where we set up shrines in the forest decorated with paper birch and blue jay feathers and made offerings to Mother Earth, um, studied the earth. And it was maybe elementary school start teaching you about global warming and extinction and things like that and the alarm bells went off in our tender hearts of like our mother is in trouble we have to do something so at the time there was this book called 50 things kids could do to save the earth we did every single one of those things in the book then there was a book that a sequel came out 50 more things kids could do to save the earth we did all the things so we were riding around on our huffy bicycles doing pollution patrol my sister was putting her body in front of loggers, full grown men with chainsaws. We were writing letters to people we found in the phone book, explaining how they could help, replacing the pencils at school, with recycled ones, taking home the can. I mean, in our, you know, in the understanding of childhood, we, we formed the Junior Ecologist Kids Club. So there was a, it's easy to laugh at the sort of naive simplicity of some of the ways that we engage, but what I will say there is something very reassuring about the moral clarity of youth. And we see this in the Sunrise Movement, right? Young people are not caught up in adults' justification of why it's more practical to go with the status quo. Young people are very clear that it is never, ever okay or justifiable to have more microplastics in the sea than stars in the galaxy. That's just mm -hmm. unacceptable, full stop. 
you know, we cannot have a situation where phytoplankton, which are the lungs of the earth producing the majority of our oxygen, are declining at 1% a year. That doesn't give us that many years. Young people understand that there's a right and a wrong, and we're not going to get caught up in the excuses or the whys. So one of the ways that little Leah is disappointed in current me is because I do sit in the ambivalence of maturity of middle age, and I understand all the reasons why it's difficult to move the wheel of time. But what little Leah is very pleased with and so gratified by is that she's not alone anymore. My sister and I felt like it was us against the whole world. <laughs> and to be surrounded by communities of Black and Brown and Indigenous folks who love the earth, who listen to the earth, who care about feeding and nourishing and healing community, who care about a just and equitable society. To get to live and breathe that alongside comrades is so deeply healing and so deeply hopeful. So yeah, she's good. She's right here next to us, hanging out. <laughs> <She's> Man, <happy. laughs> that's great to hear. And I think even in the what you named as naive simplicity of like what children will do when they when they see a problem, like thank goodness somebody wrote those books for y'all to make have those practices. And I think about you basically were building altars in the forest, right? And thinking of how spiritual you talk about being in the practices, the the spirituality that you practice. I'm just like. Yeah, that sounds like it started back then and has continued in so many ways. So I'm glad that little Leah is satisfied. And um, yeah, I think that you do a lot of our younger versions, a lot of justice. Um, I think about like the kid who wanted to be a train conductor or veterinarian and how we're talked out of, you know, right. being these things. And then we get really great examples of what they can look like, like you later on in life, like you get to play in the dirt all day and then talk <laughs> sciencey like that was one of part of the books that I'm not a huge hard science person um and so when I'm reading these facts I'm like damn this is great and and it's presented in a way that makes it really interesting because it's tied to a topic that I'm interested in um how did you come to these elements of um the book where there's just your lived experience the very sciencey stuff but also the spiritual component and I don't think we get to see these combination of things in life practice very well, but let alone in a book where the lay person can understand it. I was, these facts like moved me and I understood them. So like, how did you come up with that formula for the book? Oh, that makes me so happy. I'm a super duper science nerd. Like I like calculus jokes <laughs> and I sometimes <laughs> lament, I'll come home and I'll be like, People are always asking me to talk about racial justice, which I obviously care about and dedicated my life to and talk a lot about. And I'm like, no one has ever invited me to give a lecture on soil chemistry. Like, when is that coming? <laughs> One of my favorite aspects of soil chemistry is this amazing uh, characteristic called CEC or cation exchange capacity, which essentially has to do with how many negatively charged binding sites are on the soil, which have the potential to grab onto positively charged nutrients. So it's all about potential. It's all about hope. It's all about what might happen. Like there might not actually be any magnesium or calcium stuck on those sites, but it's ready for it. It's like it's stickiness or it's magnetism, which to me is so metaphorical for, you know, the way we think about how we built our movements and our organizations. And nature is always teaching us through example. You know, if we can read the primary text of nature, we can um, we can learn how to structure our own societies. Nature teaches us to be queer. Nature teaches us to be trans. Nature teaches us to be cooperative and generous. Um, you know, for example, I was taught, you know, as a bio student that nature is very much based in competition, so-called survival of the fittest. But science is now revealing what indigenous folks have known all along is that nature is actually much more often cooperative you know, 90% of plants rely on mycorrhizal associations, that's a fungi, just to be able to get basic nutrients. And there's a lot of talk now in the mainstream media about how the forest is actually one big super organism because this network of fungi connects all the trees and they share minerals with each other. They share sugars, they share messages, warnings, they talk to each other through this internet faster than our, you know, 5Gs and all that, like an internet of mutuality and they help each other out even when they're not related even when they're not the same species that is a powerful powerful 
metaphor example right for how we can then aspire to engage in human community supporting one another across difference reweaving ourselves into kinship so for me the you know the the social component the emotional the spirituality the science is all all deeply intertwined and it's it's a false dichotomy that somehow there's there's one way of knowing that excludes the other ways of knowing and i was very fortunate uh, in writing in researching for the book to be able to talk to you know what you'd call a hard scientist like Dr. Drew Lanham, an ornithologist, or Dr. Ayanna Elizabeth Johnson, who's a marine biologist, as well as great spiritual leaders like Awishe Bai Wanzi Abimbola, who's the spokesperson for the IFA uh, corpus for the entire world. And to see that they're really saying the same thing, they're saying the same thing, but they're reading different books in the Earth Library. Mm -hmm. But the you know the core, the core truth is essentially the same. That I think to be able to reveal that in the way that you did is really, really powerful because I think people are going to people come to a book or a text for a variety of reasons. And I was just like, they are speaking the same language or here is this spiritual component or science component that is backing a thought that I've already had. And I didn't need anything to back it, but it's great that it exists in this way. So I think that it can be really affirming to people no matter what lens they're coming from um, in regards to being able to digest the information. And I'm now recalling how you did speak about um, nature being queer, right? And if nature is has existed, will exist beyond us humans, especially if we're not um, taking care of the earth. How, um, talk a little bit about how nature is queer. Um, because I think with what, society is experiencing now or more recently, it's a constant pushback about um, against what is actually very natural that mm -hmm. we try to make feel make folks feel abnormal for existing in those ways. So I think that what you wrote about it really complements our current existence and what's always existed amongst human beings. Exactly. And so often um, nature is weaponized inaccurately to try to determine what is natural and normal. And so you often hear, you know, folks who are anti-queer and anti-trans saying things like, well, what's natural is one man and one woman, or what's natural is the binary. When in fact, if you look at the science and you look at nature, it's the opposite that's true. Take uh, flowering plants, for example, 90% of flowering plants have bisexual flowers that have both male and female components. We call them perfect flowers. They produce pollen. They also produce uh, the seed in one unit. Right, that's 90% of flowering plants. If you look in the animal kingdom, there are over 450 species that are documented that have same sex relationships, including parenting, bonding for life, sexual activity, and in all different arenas of the animal kingdom, you know, lions and dolphins and lizards and slugs and even bed bugs, right? So, no matter where you're looking, you're seeing this. So, I think it's important both to disarm. The opponent but also to affirm ourselves and our beautiful beloved community that that this is normal that we belong that there's there's reflections of us in the sacred earth is very important for fortifying that sense of of being home in our bodies and home here on the planet when we're just like oh yeah i'm just like i'm just like that peach blossom right there that's me with all gendered person just like that peach blossom that's really, and to be compared to a bleach blossom, right? Like, right. how great is that? I'll take that. I'll take that. Um, one of the components I enjoyed a great deal, and I spoke a little bit about this with regard to the bios, but how much you expose us to all the ways Black folks show up in environmentalism, like the marine biologist, the geologist, the the farmer, the, the person, um, there was just, can you talk about how great it is to come um, into connection with Black folks in arenas that folks would like to say we don't exist in, but we always have? Um, and to hear stories about some of the, the um, people you interviewed who, you know, were made fun of for, or the only ones in a class are made fun of for their interest in a particular component of environmentalism. And then also speak to if you had personally any of those experiences with being a scientist um, and geeking out over soil and so forth. <laughs> Truly a blessing. So this book was 
tender and vulnerable because as a science minded person, I like things linear and planful and under control to the extent that we can have the illusion <laughs> of control. And so to do something emergent and collaborative mm. was really a growing edge for me. I did not know how this was going to come out. I didn't even know who I was going to interview. I was inspired by Dr. George Washington Carver, as I mentioned. I was also inspired by a dream I had where these animals like the, the hawk and the, the deer and the porcupine and the beaver were coming into my house and admonishing me for forgetting how to hear their language mm. and reminding me of the covenant of childhood. So I called, uh, I do what I do when I don't know what to do, which is I called one of my elders, Mama Claudia Ford, uh, ethnobotanist, who I know listens to the earth. And I said, what's the earth saying to you? Can you still hear the language of the earth? So we did an interview and I said, well, who else? Who else can hear the earth? Called Dr. Lenny Sorensen, right? And from there, got names and just started this whole webby network of calling. Because something that actually really surprised me is how much the farming world is really separated from the environmental world, even though mm -hmm. there's a huge amount of logical overlap. So I didn't know a lot of the who's who. You know, I didn't, I didn't know I should talk to Audrey Peterman. I didn't know that Rue Map was the one to talk to. So people were telling me, as James Edward Mills, people were telling me as we went along. And I didn't know what they were going to say or how it would come together. So the, the fact that it ended up being these sort of reverse engineered interviews based on theme with opening essays, you know, emerged from actually what came in the conversations. It was not prescripted. And a deep, I learned something different from every person. For example, um, Audrey Peterman, who I mentioned, she's a Jamaican elder among the first black people to travel to almost all the national parks in the country, also an author a big advocate for wild spaces and a deeply spiritual person. She's one of those people that the divine light just radiates with mm. every word they say. You should check out what we just did an Instagram live and I was in tears the whole time. Mm. Anyway, one of the things that uh, Audrey Peterman said is that the first time she saw the night sky unencumbered by light pollution out in the Midwest in the parks, she realized that there was a time when all people could read the sky. Mm as primary source. You could tell the calendar, the directionality, the stories of your people, the weather by looking at the sky, right? Echoed by Lenny Sorensen, there was a time when everybody knew that you plant corn when oak leaves are the size of squirrel's ears. But we've gotten ourselves into a dangerous game of telephone where very few people can read the earth. So they whisper their message to the next person, who whispers their scrambled message to the next person, who whispers their scrambled message to the next person. So we're on tertiary, quaternary sources and more. And what we end up with as our guidepost is so distorted, so removed from the primary source that we're just completely lost as a civilization. So she's like, it's all about learning how to read again. So the sky, the leaves, the bird song, the pH of the ocean, you know, whatever that language is to read again and to actually be in touch with primary source. And that was such a moving frame shift for me. You know, like think about it this way. If you were living in a neighborhood your entire life and you didn't know the names of any of your neighbors, people would probably have judgments on your character, like rightfully so. And yet here we are in neighborhoods of black cherry and pin oak and, you know, red spotted newts. And we don't know, we don't know one from the other, right? We've been there our whole lives. We don't even know their names, much less anything about them, many of us, right? Mm -hmm. And so what it, what is it to actually come back to the neighborhood and like knock on the door and bring some bread, you know, yeah. to actually get to know again this place that we live, that we call home, that is honestly, in my belief, yearning mm -hmm. for us to, uh, to come back, you know, into relationship. Yeah. Um, how do we get there though, right? Like, how do we learn to read the sky? How do we learn to pay enough attention or know what to pay attention to, to learn these languages that we've lost along the way for a variety of justifiable or unjustifiable right. reasons, right? Like, um, I am an outdoors person. I grew up in Hawaii. Um, I have the goal of getting to every national park there is. Um, oh, wow. <laughs> I've hiked part of the national or the Appalachian Trail just and bike touring and all these things. And still, it's not enough 
to learn the language. Like I can't read this guy. I do look up and I can point out the Big Dipper and maybe Oh Boy's belt, but like beyond that, <laughs> I'm like, you know, it's like how much unlearning I one has to do, but what are, or do you know of any practices for us to go deeper into these foreign languages, I think? It's a good way to frame it as a foreign language. And you know, we don't pressure ourselves to learn all the languages. Like we can start with a few of the names or a few of the star constellations and make friends with people who know, right? But I think that um, the process of relearning ourselves into kinship. So something that was really powerful, I'm not a musician, my children are, thank goodness, but I interviewed B. Anderson, Toshi Regan and Farmer Jan about the connection with music. And they pointed out that most people actually still do speak and hear two languages of the earth, at least. And those are song and silence. And in my research, something so fascinating to learn was that our musical intelligence actually came from studying nature. So, you know, from the California wren, right, we learn the octave, right? From the hermit thrush, we learn the pentatonic scale, we learn the chromatic scale from another bird. So, so these ways that we, we engage with tonality and interval come from birds. And that depending on what region folks' ancestors come from, their songs and their scales reflect, reflect the sounds of nature. So like the Hutu and the Tutsi with the, the sounds of the elephants or the folks near uh, on Vanatu with the sounds of their volcano. So that fascinated me to think about what it is to lean into song as a language and also silence. Um, in many indigenous cultures, including amongst the Mbuti people, silence is considered uh, the source of peace and when the voice of the ancestors and the sacred can come through. And I, I like to imagine that John Francis Planet Walker, mm. who's a black elder, uh, who witnessed an oil spill, I think it was 1971 in, in San Francisco Bay, and was so traumatized by this oil spill that he swore off motorized transport and walked around the country for 22 years, of which 17 were in silence. So this person, you know, earned a PhD, wrote oil spill legislation while being silent and while walking and not using any fossil fuels, right? Sitting in what is arguably one of the languages of the earth we still know, mm. right? Shelton Johnson writes about this um, and just saying like, the earth has no use for anything that comes out of our mouths except prayers, songs, mm. and silence. Let the wind do the talking if, that's, if there's mm. nothing else that you have to say. Mm. So I like to start there because we all have access, right? We all have access to like, <laughs> you know, <laughs> the earth can like speak to us in these ways that are more subtle. Um, and then in a more, you know, practical sense, there's a lot, there's a lot I don't know about the earth because I didn't learn this growing up. And even if you study biology, they teach you abstractions. They don't teach you about like living actual beings. So I get my Seek app out and it's like a game we play as a family where we try to identify, you know, the plants and the insects and, and bit by bit you learn and you recognize, mm -hmm. right? Um, so there are ways and it takes patience, but it's really worthwhile because I think it gives us back our present moment and it gives us back the home that we inhabit mm -hmm. when we can be and understand really where we are. Does that make sense? Absolutely. And what you're saying brings up two things. One, I'm a huge John Francis fan, <laughs> so much so that um, I used to have mouthless Mondays where I did not talk in an F. I mean, I was like, I don't know if I can be silent for 17 years, but if I can oh take a day God. a week. Wait, how did that go? Will you tell us about this? <laughs> The first day I did it, my um, best friend called me and I picked up and started talking to him. And I was like, dang, dude, I told you, we both forgot. But my my children and my community were in complete support of it. Um, and I really enjoyed it. Like I was just much more at peace. I think life got so busy with work that I had to eliminate it. But I'm at a point in my life where I'm trying to bring it back um, and hold that day. Just no technology and being silent to see what comes up. And I've also um, practiced Vipassana and I've done like a 10 day meditation retreat where you can't even look at people, let alone be quiet. Mm -hmm. So I think there's a lot of beauty um, in science and I mean, in silence and a lot to learn. I think about 
the pandemic too, right? Like when the cars came off the street, the factories stopped doing whatever they do. I feel like I heard the birds more and yeah. I'm, I'm woken up by the birds every day. And I don't, I'm not a birder in the way I was like, am I a sound birder? Like, should I be able to identify based mm-hmm. on sound? And I'm really interested in that, but there's an app for that too. But anyway. See, <laughs> and I love it. There's an app for everything. If we want to connect to the earth, as long as we take ourselves out of the app and like live in it at the same time, right. There's hey. sky parks where there's um, very minimal light pollution. It's none at all that allow you to see the stars better and things like that. Um, so wait, I just, we have so much to talk about. So <laughs> I just came off of a pasta and a retreat, which was totally amazing. Yeah. Just like everything. That's a whole other topic. And I know you're supposed to be asking me questions, but can you <laughs> tell us a little bit about, I also hiked the Appalachian Trail for a couple of, a little portion of it. So how did, like, how was that experience for you of being on the trail or being in these wild spaces that, you know, have excluded black and brown folks intentionally yeah. for so many generations, but yet, of course, are also our home? Wow, you're asking me questions. This is I'll amazing. Just, I'll <laughs> not, just this one. I'm, I'm very curious. Um, so when I was in college, I wanted to do a through hike. And then I, I have children. And so that's not possible in, in a way. And so I asked a friend who you also quoted, Alcee Parks, and found out she was a hiker. And I was like, you want to hike the Appalachian with me? And we decided to just break it up in sections. Um, I mean, we sent a fundraising letter out to our comrades and we're like, we don't have gear. Can y'all help us get gear? And just borrowed a lot and mapped it out. And Alcee and I just really love like working for our food and fetching our water. And I, we went consecutively for three years and we finally crossed into North Carolina. So we're also carrying kale and avocado and fresh food with us. So our packs were really heavy. You carried fresh food with you? Yo. It's like we, I think that's the thing I like to tell people because I have an outfitter company. Is like, you don't have to eat these uh, GI packs. Like you can eat what you want. You just got to carry it. And if you're willing to carry it, you'll eat really well. And we do. We ate really, really well. But I'll say the time we crossed into North Carolina, I think we thought we knew more than we actually did. And nature showed us our ass because we didn't use our checklist and it snowed and we had one emergency blanket. It was one of those moments where I was like, oh, you you fucked up. You thought you knew what you were doing. And nature was like, I'm unpredictable. And so it snowed in North Carolina. It snowed. The through hikers were wild. They were like, we are not prepared for this. We left the trail early because I just couldn't endure it. Um, Mm. We wore everything we had and just kind of froze. And I was like, I'm good. I got the privilege to leave. So we left. But um, it's really amazing. And then we took, I've taken two different groups of about 10 Black folks on three to four day hikes on the Appalachian um, and people who thought they wouldn't use the bathroom there and just, you know, city folks. And they came out knowing how to build a fire and like just really yes. confident about their experience in the outdoors. And so, yeah, yeah, really great. Oh, thank you for sharing. That's so inspiring and beautiful. As an aside, I'm gonna be on sabbatical from June through December. So the first like real break in my life, I became a parent very young, started Soul Fire Farm and just have been going like full court press, sometimes multiple jobs, those 80 hour week, you know, just going mm-hmm. and going and there's a couple of, very strong signals uh, from my body and soul that that is not going to continue to work. So during the sabbatical, I have a number of backpacking trips and hikes that I'm dreaming up and meditation retreats and deeper practice. So we'll talk. I would love to talk more about that, but I think, yeah, yeah. Um, just let yourself immerse. Yes. And I'm so glad that you're taking that time for yourself. Um, I I think about, the level of cortisol in black women's bodies in particular, this, you know, the stress hormone and how we just become accustomed to it and move with it, not even knowing that this isn't, this is an abnormal level of stress. Mm -hmm. So I'm always Mm -hmm. celebrating folks who take the time off to, when they finally can carve it out um, to take for themselves. So I look forward to what comes up for you. It's gonna be great. Speaking of soul fire and seed saving, um, in the book, you spoke of Amarith being the seed that, you know, you love to save. 
I was like, what was the first seed you planted, y'all planted at Soul Fire? Oh, and where did it come seed. from? Well, it's, it's, that's a great question because this is, you know, sometimes, yeah, anyway, it was garlic. It was garlic was the first thing that we planted. And the thing that was so special about the garlic was that it was seed that I had been saving since I was a teenager. So I've worked on farms since 1996. I worked at, um, uh, many hands organic farm at food project farm school Worcester community gardens youth grow program um, that my then friend now spouse started and at the time we were living in Worcester it was a little known fact but we were living in an anarchist punk house collective that's where both of our children were born that was like tore off fossil fuels and was just kind of like crusty punk world anyway you know, food not bombs and bike not bombs and the radical firecracker bookstore and all that kind of stuff, consensus decision making meetings that go late into the night with people wilding out. Anyway, Ooh, hard so, work, hard work. Yes. So we, you know, big shout out to the collective of Gogo. But um, while living there, one of my duties was to tend the the garden uh, that that provided a lot of the food for that punk house. And and that's where that seed, that's where I started saving um, the seed of a particular kind of music, hard neck, kind of reddish garlic, and just kept saving it and then brought it with me when we moved to New York and kept it going in the community garden and then planted it. The nice thing about garlic, and I'm sure some of you know this, but it doesn't require a lot of tending. So even before we had moved out to the lands, when we were still building the house and digging the well and putting in the driveway, um, well, I can plant garlic because it only needs a few touches a year. So. You know, we did a little raised bed, put it in there, and and had our first harvest even before we were living there. That's amazing. That's such a a great story as well. Like your trajectory to where you are feels very aligned from where that started. Um, do you still have that garlic in we do. rotation? That's amazing. And it it actually came up. I hope it's okay because we had a thaw in the winter and it popped up very early and now we have we got three feet of snow yesterday it's still on the ground or our last week it's still on the ground so usually garlic is pretty hardy and it will pull through i certainly hope so because we plant oh i don't know four thousand bulbs or you know cloves <laughs> four thousand <laughs> a lot <laughs> it's a ton of garlic but you know what it's also plant medicine so it makes sense to have so much of it um what in the book do you have a favorite not person you interviewed but a section of it that just warms your heart and you know front and back and just just makes you shine even brighter than you're already shining <laughs> oh a favorite section or part it's like you don't want to everyone's my favorite right it's like trying to say you have a favorite you know, family member, something like that. They're all my family. But let's just see what just like opened my world. You know, Alice Walker really taught me some things and not in the way that I expected. So obviously, you know, many of us really revere Alice Walker as a dear, dear elder and dear, like, the way the writing weaves ourselves back into belonging and ancestral memory is so profound. Like there are layers in that writing that, that she revealed. But I'll tell you that when I interviewed Mama Alice, I'd ask a lot of questions and she just wouldn't not answer them. She was like, that is not a good question. <laughs> <laughs> and of course I'm sweating, you know, it's like, oh my God, I don't know if they like me. You know, for example, I asked her, and she still doesn't tell me why, but I think I have an idea, especially now that I've done this meditation retreat. So there was one question I asked her, um, if she could distill, you know, she's so prolific. So all her myriad works, her writing, her short stories, um, interviews, and there was sort of one kernel of wisdom that would remain seven generations from now, what would that be? And she was like, that's not important, you know? Essentially like, I'm um, dust. We're all not to be attached. This is what I'm reading into her answer, her refusal to answer. We are all not to be attached to this sort of concept of I and self and ego and legacy and imprint on the world. Whatever she puts out there just cycles back into the everything that is. 
right? And echoes in the way that all things echo and come together. So it's like, what what do you mean, legacy? What do you mean? <laughs> you know? Um, which I'm about to introduce a very special surprise for y'all um, that that helps us understand even more deeply, you know, what it is that we're like all part of that cycle all part of each other, like I am you and you are me and I am the tree and the tree is me. And there's really not like a separation there. Yeah. <laughs> I love what's happening in the chat right now. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of people's feelings would be hurt about not needing to leave a legacy or thinking about themselves in that way. So I appreciate that she said that to you though. Um, Cause I think a lot of folks are caught up in that. I have one more question before. Yeah, of course. Um, the surprise. The surprise. <laughs> Um, what question do you like to be asked, but doesn't get asked to you or that you always hope someone might ask you? Do I have to answer it or just ask it? <laughs> However you feel. <laughs> what question do I not get asked? Um, well, I kind of already said, I really do like nerding out about like obscure soil chemistry things and science things. So, um, Maybe, so any question along the lines of what inspires you about symbiogenesis, like something like that. <laughs> I would really like to be asked. <laughs> Do you want to answer that? Sure. Yeah, I'll answer what inspires me about symbiogenesis. <laughs> so this goes back to talking about how nature is more cooperative than competitive. And actually, our bodies would not exist without one of the most fundamental and beautiful acts of cooperation that ever happens on planet earth, which is that two pro prokaryotic bacteria, those are like little tiny single cell organisms, one of whom had a magical molecule called chlorophyll that enabled it to drink sunlight and turn it into sugar. Mm -hmm. And one that had a nice, thick, beautiful membrane of protection decided to link their wagons together and have a shared destiny and actually one like engulf the other and that created the first eukaryotic cell which gave us plant life mm. um and in a similar way this energy producing cell and this this membrane came together and produced our first mitochondria which is what allows our bodies to make energy out of sugar and so we actually have two sets of dna in our bodies like our nucleus has the dna that comes from our parents but inside of our mitochondria, there's an unchanged DNA strand back to like the beginning of life on earth because there's a separate organism that exists inside of each of our cells that is now so much a part of us that it's become, you know, it's like become part of our biome. And that, that really fascinates me, just the way that cooperation is inherent to everything around us. I love the way you're glowing and I totally would take a science class that you taught just so you know if you ever want to offer that. I appreciate that. that. I did teach up. science in the high school for 17 years. So my whole mission was to like really get young people excited that they're part of planet Earth. I was like, yeah. it's just so cool. I mean, it's yeah. cool. <laughs> That's amazing. That's amazing. So we can move on to our surprise now. Okay. So <laughs> I'm going to, let me just check if this works if I unplug. Nope. Nope. <laughs> no. Oh, damn. <laughs> Snap. Snap. <laughs> <laughs> Trying to do the most. <laughs> and I'm not a tech person. I don't even know what to do. <laughs> Where's <the> ER? <laughs> Snap. Bear with us, y'all. Thanks for your patience, y'all. In the meantime, though, so when Leah gets back, if y'all have questions you want to ask her, please drop them into the chat. 
Oh, Leah, I can hear you. Oh, good. My internet's just slow. I think I'm coming back. Okay. I won't touch anything this time. I promise. <laughs> don't touch the mic. Don't touch the buttons. Can you all see me yet? Cannot see you. All right, we'll give it just a second. Okay. It's like spinning the little wheel of thinking about letting me join all the way back in. All right, oh, you're coming. I there think you it's are. working. Woo! All right. So let's do it. All right. So I want to bring up um, my wonderful womb and soul sister, Naima Peniman, who is the artist behind this gorgeous book cover for Black Earth Wisdom called Listening to the Earth, as well as the program director at Soul Fire Farm, the co-founder of Wild Seed and a widely published uh, poet, author, internationally acclaimed artist. And so Naima is going to share a beautiful poem that they, they wrote for the book that concludes the book with you all tonight. So give it up in the chat, make some noise. Woo -woo. <laughs> Greetings, hello, hello. peace family. So happy to be with you and I am so so honored to contribute to this beautiful chorus of Black Earth listeners as a conduit to the important messages for us to abide to in these times. So much praise and honor to my sister Leah and I greet you truly as family knowing that we share the same mother and therefore are all kin. And this poem that concludes the book and that will also include our time together for now is a distillation of some of the lessons from Mama Nature, who is certainly my greatest teacher. And I hope we could apply this wisdom to the path ahead. Mama Nature told me, I am part of you. You are part of me. When we forgot, she remembered us. When we were lost, she found us. Mama Nature told me we are stronger together. She showed me the interspecies marriage of algae and fungi who fell in love across kingdoms, birthed a new life form capable of making home on stone, adept at staying alive in the harshest conditions. Could we be like that? Join forces across difference, weave our powers, individual but undividable, in the midst of unthinkable circumstances, learn how to flourish together. Mama Nature told me, Blackness is precious and must be respected, and must be protected from artificial light, and must be tended. She showed me the indigo night, the miracle of starlight, the deep dark ocean, the rich black soils brimming with life. Mama Nature told me, nothing and no one is disposable. It all goes back to the cycle. She showed me there is no such thing as a way. Not for our waste heaped high in landfills or amassing in the Pacific. Not for our people deemed throwaway, warehoused in cages and open air prisons. There is no escaping the totality of this single beating earth. There is no mistaking all of us belong. Mama Nature told me, you are made of the same matter as stardust. Remember your connection to everything. She showed me this animate force of existence pulsing all around us, doing everything in its power to regenerate life. Even in death, she showed me a hollowed out tree 
still standing, long dead, a hatchery for starlings, a porcupine den, a perch for owls, a hideout for bats, a food cache for chipmunks, a nut hatches nest. Could we feel our ancestors' love like that, palpable and present all around us, sheltering and nourishing us, supporting our flourishing? Could we be eternal? Mm. Mama Nature told me transformation is inevitable, adaption is essential, change creates openings. She showed me how dolphins evolve dorsal fins to withstand the wild movement of the ocean, how plants befriended fungi who helped them migrate out of water, who taught them how to grow roots, who showed them how to survive on scorched land until together they transformed the atmosphere, built soil over stones, and patiently, unmistakably changed the entire world. Could we be like that? Work together to do the unthinkable and shift the course of destiny. Mama Nature asked me, what will be your contribution? How will you partner with renewal to usher evolution? What are you willing to let go of? How are you willing to grow? Will you remember you are intrinsic to something bigger? What will you give rise to with the life force you've been given? Mother Nature asked me, can you hear me and are you listen. Okay. Thank you, Naima. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> Stay there. I want to take a picture of y'all. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Yay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Do you want to stay? I'll go for it. Aww. <laughs> we'll just stick around. <laughs> Let's see if there are any questions. And then I know ER is trying to get back on too, but um, Leah, thank you so much for being in conversation. And I'm glad that you got to answer and ask the question you never got asked. You never get asked. No, thank you. That might have been a once in a lifetime opportunity <laughs> to answer that question. <laughs> it's going to come up now. It's going to come up. <laughs> be like, I know you're really into bacteria. Let's talk about it. Um, but yes, uh, Black Earth Wisdom, y'all, it's, it's a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful offering. Um, and I highly suggest. Um, if you don't think it's your jam, you'll be pleasantly surprised. And if you already know it's your jam, then give a good review, buy a gift. I think it's a perfect gift for somebody. I'm passing it on to my sons next. So thank you so much for this um, offer. I think it's an offering to humanity. Like we have a lot to learn and this is a great way to hear things um, that we need to know. Thank um, you. And thank you so much for the beautiful questions and heartfelt conversation and sharing a little bit of yourself in the space. Oh, thanks. Really we'll have to chop it up Vipassana too. I know. <laughs> if folks do want to purchase the book, of course, Kara has it available. It's a one click buy that um, teal, what do you, strip tab. You click it and you can purchase the book below um, the screens and all of us would greatly, greatly, greatly appreciate it. And you will be doing yourself, um, giving yourself a great, great gift. So we highly encourage you doing that but I won't hold you any longer. Are there any questions, y'all? I'll just say, if you wanna get involved with our work at Soul Fire Farm, you can check us out at soulfirefarm.org or on all the socials, Soul Fire Farm. We have volunteer opportunities. There's a reparations map where you can support black, brown and indigenous land stewards and copious resources for ways to get involved and make a difference. So definitely check us out and stay part of the conversation. Awesome. Thank you for that. Y'all have a wonderful evening and be safe, everybody. Don't forget to buy the book. <laughs>